Hello and welcome. Thank you for taking the time to learn more about hydraulic fracturing, also known as fracking, and the other negative impacts from the oil and natural gas industry in Arkansas. I'd like to introduce myself and our organization. We are ArkansasFracking.org. We're a nonprofit organization that works to protect Arkansas and Arkansans from the negative impacts of this oil and natural gas industry. We're calling for a temporary moratorium on hydraulic fracturing in Arkansas until our state and federal agencies have time to do the proper environmental and human health impact studies, until regulations are adequate, and until fracturing is not allowed within our aquifers. My name is Sam Lane. I'm the director of ArkansasFracking.org. I'm a lifetime Arkansan from Greenbrier. My wife April and my sister Emily are also organization leaders. Our organization currently has almost 300 official members and is growing quickly. Many more support our cause around the natural state. I'm also running for a state representative in the new District 67 against Shell Caucus member Stephen Meeks. You will learn more about this caucus in a moment. Members of our organization include those who have been negatively impacted by the natural gas industry here in Arkansas, including royalty owners and industry employees. We realize that many people in the area are employed in the natural gas industry. We all have friends and family members employed in the industry. We have talked to numerous employees and reviewed OSHA regulations. We are very concerned for the health and well-being of the employees in the industry, especially those on drilling crews, frack crews, fluid transporters, and those who work around compressor stations and maintain producing wells. Industry employees will have a high percent of long-term health problems associated with not only the nature of their job, but from improper training, improper equipment, and a culture of downplaying the dangers and risks of these jobs by industry management. A moratorium or ban would be hard for many people, but the potential for what could happen to the area and state and people from the negative impacts of this industry could be far worse in the long run. If you would like more information about our group and the negative impacts of this industry, if you want to become a member or if you would like to donate, please come to our website at www.arkansasfracking.org. You can also visit my campaign website at www.samlane4u.com. So what is fracking? Fracking is short for hydraulic fracturing. It is also sometimes spelled with a C and without a K. It is a type of unconventional oil and natural gas extraction and involves drilling a hole and pumping millions of gallons of water mixed with sand and chemicals into the ground. This breaks up rock formations like shale to release trapped oil and gas. New regulatory exemptions for the industry along with new technology like horizontal drilling has created a rush for natural gas and oil from shale and other rock formations around the country. There are three major natural gas producers in the Fayetteville Shale. Houston-based Southwestern Energy operates under a subsidiary company named SECO. Irving, Texas-based ExxonMobil operates under a subsidiary XTO Energy. And the third is an Australian company named BHP Billiton. ExxonMobil is the largest publicly traded oil and gas company in the world. And there is one more small producer that only has a couple of wells in the state. These companies contract out most of the work in to other companies. Dozens of companies are involved in the entire process from building the pad, drilling the hole, fracking the well, installing pipeline, making and storing chemicals, transporting fluids and equipment, etc. When a problem or a violation occurs, there's often a lot of finger pointing. Let's take a look at a video from the largest producer of Fayetteville shale gas, Southwestern Energy. This video is typical from the industry and shows the drilling and fracking steps of the process. Let's take a look at the horizontal drilling and stimulation processes that have made shale exploration so successful. Notice this video is only about the drilling and fracturing steps of the process. It does not mention building the pad, the road and pipeline network, or compressor stations that are all necessary major steps in the process. The first step is to drill the vertical portion of the well. As the drill bit grinds away, air is pumped down the drill pipe through the bit and into the hole to move the rock cuttings from the well bore to the surface. Many people associate water contamination from fracking with only the fracturing process by itself. We received a lot of complaints from residents in the area whose water wells became contaminated, 
during the drilling process when it was occurring near their homes. As this drill bit passes through the aquifer and then below the freshwater zone, it disturbs underground substances that can be harmful to people such as heavy metals and other things. These substances are normally only found in extremely small quantities in our water, but as the drilling occurs, these are released in greater quantities and pulled through our upper freshwater zone in the aquifer. This contaminates well water for people in the area. The hole is drilled below the deepest freshwater zone. Again, notice they are careful to say the deepest freshwater zone. This is because at a certain depth, water in an aquifer becomes saline and therefore it's not fit for human use anymore. However, all of these aquifers are interconnected. So that allows pathways for things that are injected at greater depths to eventually migrate upward into the freshwater area. The drill pipe and bit are then removed and steel pipe, called surface casing, is inserted into the drilled hole to isolate the freshwater zones. This casing also serves as the base for attaching the well control equipment, which are safety devices that connect the rig to the well bore. Cement is then pumped down the casing and out through the casing shoe, which is located at the bottom of the casing. The cement continues moving upward between the steel casing and the well bore to the surface. This cementing process seals the well bore from the surrounding rock and the freshwater zones, preventing contamination of the freshwater aquifers. After this concrete casing can fail for many reasons. Poor materials, poor workmanship, earthquakes, as is common in the Fayetteville Shale area, and deterioration over time. Concrete also shrinks over time, and this can cause the seal at the bottom of the casing to fail. Casing failure can occur during the fracturing process or long afterwards. The chemicals used stay potent in the ground for hundreds or even thousands of years. The industry maintains that water contamination has never been proven to occur from chemicals injected at the contamination point deep underground, but they admit that the cause of numerous cases of water contamination across the country comes from the failure of this casing, which is not uncommon. One of the main factors in the BP oil spill in the Gulf was a casing failure. The cement hardens. The drill pipe and a smaller bit are lowered back down the hole to drill through the cement left at the bottom of the hole and then to continue drilling the vertical section of the well. As the well is drilled deeper, a mixture of water and additives called mud is pumped into the hole to cool the bit and move the rock cuttings to the surface. Notice they say a mixture of water and additives is pumped in the hole. These additives are lubricants and other oils and chemicals. These also are released into the aquifer as they drill through. At about 500 feet above the planned horizontal portion of the well, the drill pipe and bit are pulled out of the hole. Up to this point, the process has been the same as drilling a vertical well. However, now a specialized downhole drilling motor with measurement while drilling instruments is lowered into the hole to begin the angle building process. This depth is called the kickoff point and it's where the curve drilling begins to make the transition from a vertical well to a horizontal well. The distance to drill the curve from the kickoff point to where the well bore becomes truly horizontal is about 600 feet. Once the curve is completed, drilling begins on the well's horizontal section called the lateral, which can be a few thousand feet long. The pipe used to drill the well measures 30 feet in length per section, and each section weighs approximately 495 pounds. It takes over 350 sections of pipe, weighing nearly 87 tons, to drill a 10,500 foot well. At various stages of drilling, the pipe is taken out of the hole for tool and bit changes, and then put back in. This process is called tripping pipe. When the well reaches its targeted distance, the drill pipe and bit are removed from the well bore one last time. Steel pipe, referred to as production casing, is inserted into the full length of the well bore. Cement is again pumped down the casing and out through the casing shoe. The cement continues moving up between the casing and the wall of the hole, filling the open space known as the annulus. Upon completion of the cementing process, the production casing is pressure tested to ensure its integrity. Casing the well is a very important process 
because it permanently secures the well bore, and it prevents hydrocarbons and other fluids from seeping out into the upper formations. Again, they say this casing permanently seals the well bore. Concrete doesn't last forever, so it's not permanent, and it can also crack and fail for many reasons. As the fluids are brought to the surface, at this point, the drilling rig is no longer needed. A temporary wellhead is installed, and the location is ready for the service crews who will prepare the well for production. The first step in the production process is to perforate or perf the casing. Workers lower a perforating gun by wire line into the casing to the targeted section of the horizontal leg. An electrical current is sent down the wire line to the perf gun. This current triggers a charge that shoots small holes through the casing and cement, and then out a short distance into the shale formation. The perf gun is then pulled out of the hole. Because the shale is tight, it has low permeability and porosity, the well will have to be fractured or fracked. Hydraulic fracturing is a process where water, sand, and additives are pumped into the well bore and down the casing under high pressure. Again, they say water, sand, and additives. These additives can be anywhere from 50 to 500 different chemicals. Most are extremely harmful to humans, plants, and animals. They can cause acute, immediate health problems as well as long-term health effects like cancer, as most are known carcinogens. No studies have been done on the health effects of all of these chemicals when they're all mixed together. As the mixture is forced out through the perforations and into the surrounding rock, the pressure causes the shale to fracture, and the sand remains behind to prop open these small microfractures. The An optimal frac will crack the rock in up to 500 feet in all directions. So these cracks from the well hole up to the end can be 500 feet up, down, and laterally out in all directions. These microfractures create a pathway connecting the reservoir to the well, allowing the gas to flow into the well bore. The horizontal leg is fracked one section at a time, and a temporary plug is placed just above each newly fracked section. The plug isolates the perforated fracked section of the well bore so that the next section of the horizontal leg can be perforated and fracked. This process of perfing and fracking can be repeated several times to cover the entire horizontal distance of the well bore. Once fracking is completed, the plugs are drilled out allowing the gas to flow up the well bore. Tight reservoirs like shale do not typically contain many natural fractures and therefore cannot be produced economically without hydraulic fracturing. Each hydraulic fracture treatment is designed to contain the induced microfractures within the target formation. In addition, the differing physical properties of the bounding formations act to limit fracture growth outside the target formation. The surface groundwater resources are protected by multiple strings of steel casing and cement in the well bore, as well as by several thousand feet of rock that separates the target shale formation from the shallow groundwater zone. These intervening layers of rock often contain multiple layers of shale or siltstone that act as natural barriers to the vertical migration of fluids. While multiple layers of casing do exist at the immediate surface, as you go down a little bit farther, there is only one layer of casing called the surface casing. Arkansas requires that the surface casing only go to a thousand feet below the surface. They do not require an intermediate casing as some other states do, which would basically mean that the casing would go all the way from the surface down to the bottom of the hole. They only require the surface casing and then a production casing, but no casing in between. Also, their diagram shows 4,000 feet of sediment in between the freshwater zone and where the fracturing occurs. This is not true in Arkansas, as Arkansas has one of the shallowest shale layers in the country. There are gas wells in the state that are only 1,200 feet deep in the Fayetteville shale area, and over half of the approximately 3,800 wells in the Fayetteville shale area are less than the 4,000 feet deep shown here. Also notice throughout the presentation they were careful to use the term freshwater and their diagram actually shows usable freshwater. This is because in the Fayetteville Shale area, groundwater extends from the surface all the way down to about 12,000 to 15,000 feet deep. At a certain depth this water becomes saline 
or too salty and is not fit for human use. However, these major aquifers are all interconnected and the Fayetteville Shale area is in the middle of an aquifer. Numerous faults in the area also provide avenues for chemicals to migrate upwards into freshwater zones over time. Even this diagram shows many vertical cracks and faults through the different layers of rock. This allows for this fluid to migrate from here up to the surface. It may take a period of years before we see widespread water contamination, but we're very concerned that over the next two, five, ten, or twenty years, eventually these trillions and trillions of gallons of water and chemicals that we've injected underground will eventually make their way to the surface near our freshwater zone and we will see widespread water contamination. The final step is to install a permanent wellhead, also known as a Christmas tree, and other necessary surface equipment at the well site, and connect a pipeline to the well that will transport the gas to the nation's pipeline network. Pipelines can be very dangerous. They're known to explode quite frequently all across the country. As field development expands, additional pipeline infrastructure is built. Notice their diagram does not show any houses or other buildings in the middle of the production area. The creek in the picture is still blue, which is uncommon as most creeks in areas of dense natural gas production are often brown. This is from the thousands of acres of newly cleared land in the area. Before I talk about the negative impacts of each step in the process, it's important to know how we got where we're at today and how the industry is regulated. Industry supporters often tout the fact that hydraulic fracturing has been around for a long time. This is true as stimulation of oil and gas has existed since the 1940s. Halliburton patented the technique and was the first company to use it commercially. The process used only a small amount of water and did not contain the mixture of chemicals that it does today. Hydraulic fracturing was also used for fluid waste disposal by various companies in the U.S. military. Horizontal drilling has been around for a long time too, but it was very difficult, costly, and took a long amount of time. Over time, hydraulic fracturing and horizontal drilling evolved to closer to what they are today, but they were not used together for oil and gas extraction. Modern, high volume, slick water hydraulic fracturing in vertical wells was beginning to be used in coal seam gas formations in the late 1980s, but was never widely used in the United States because of high production costs, as well as environmental, human health, and property rights laws. By the late 1990s, fracking was starting to be done on an extreme scale in relatively small parts of Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming. This was only done in areas with extremely low populations that were usually vast expanses of open ranch land. Companies like to attribute the current shale gas boom on a new technology of horizontal drilling. Horizontal or directional drilling has been around since the 1930s. As I said earlier, it was very difficult, time consuming, and could only be done by a handful of companies. In the 1970s, downhole drilling motors were invented. These motors turned the drill bit while the pipe didn't turn. A few years later, measure while drilling tools were invented, which allowed real-time measurements to be beamed back to the surface. These advancements made horizontal drilling much easier. However, it was still not coupled with hydraulic fracturing at this point. With abundance of low-cost conventional oil and gas wells, high-cost horizontal fracked wells were not practical. With low oil and gas prices, it was not even profitable, let alone practical in most cases. As conventional oil and gas reserves were depleted in the U.S., companies started to look at new techniques that would allow them to extract trapped oil and natural gas from coal seam gas, tight sands, limestone, and other rock formations. Let's take a look at the policies that allowed this shale gas boom to take place. During his second week in office in early 2001, President George W. Bush created the Energy Task Force naming Vice President Dick Cheney the chairman of this task force. Mr. Cheney is the former CEO of Halliburton. If you haven't heard of Halliburton, you should have. As I said before, they are the company that invented fracking and one of the oldest, largest, and most controversial oil and gas companies in the world. This task force was also comprised mostly of oil and gas industry executives. Their pur purpose was to create energy policy for America. This task force released a report in May of 2001 detailing their recommendations for energy policy. This report recommended loosening regulations on the oil and gas industry and gave little mention to renewable energy. By late 2001, hydraulic fracturing had began to be used on a larger scale in Wyoming, Utah, and Colorado in coal bed methane deposits as you saw in the pictures a moment ago. The EPA was receiving more and more complaints of water problems by residents in these areas, so they began a study on fracking in these coal bed methane deposits. 
again, it was not widely implemented at this point, nor used in any shale deposits, because unlike most coal bed methane, most shale and other deposits, including the Fayetteville shale, lie within aquifers. We will explore this fact more later. Companies were not permitted by the Safe Drinking Water Act to put chemicals into aquifers. In 2004, the EPA released their report on this study they had been working on. This report expressed some concerns, but summarized that fracking, quote, posed little or no threat to drinking water sources. The report made this statement based on federal regulations that were in place to regulate the industry, but it did not consider the safety of fracking if it was regulated by state laws that are grossly inadequate in most states like Arkansas. It also did not report on other aspects of the process like air contaminants, fluid disposal, truck and noise problems, etc. EPA administrators that worked on the project, including the director of the water division, now admit that this study was, quote, a small snapshot in time and that further study of hydraulic fracturing was needed. An interesting note is that the report also states that there is a risk of groundwater contamination from fracking in areas where faults exist, such as the case in the entire Fayetteville shale area. We will explore this too in a moment. Before this report was released, Mr. Cheney and his task force had been working with the chairman of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, Joe Barton, to draft the Energy Policy Act. Representative Barton is from Texas, the home state of President Bush and Vice President Cheney. Texas is the largest oil and gas producing state in the country. Representative Barton has a background as a consultant in the oil and gas industry. He has always been and continues to be a very vocal supporter of the oil and gas industry. Mr. Barton garnered much attention in 2010 after he actually apologized to BP during a congressional hearing. His apology came after President Obama and the Attorney General worked out a deal with BP to set up a $20 billion cleanup and recovery fund in the wake of, B of the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. This deal was not forced but agreed upon by BP. His comments received much rebuke from both parties, Republican and Democrat. Mr. Cheney, Mr. Barton, and President Bush used the EPA report, along with the rhetoric of high gas prices and reducing our dependence on foreign oil, to begin lobbying Congress to pass the Energy Policy Act. In the spring of 2005, this picture stirred some controversy when the King of Saudi Arabia visited President Bush's Texas ranch to discuss skyrocketing gasoline prices. Prices had doubled from about $1.25 a gallon when President Bush took office to about $2.50 a gallon by the time this visit took place. The king agreed to ramp up production in Saudi Arabia, but said that it would have little effect on gasoline prices in the U.S., and it did not. Gas prices continued to rise. In July of 2005, about three months after this picture was taken, the Energy Policy Act was passed by Congress and President Bush. President Bush even held a celebratory cer ceremony when he signed the act into law. The Energy Policy Act exempted the entire oil and gas industry from most of the Safe Drinking Water Act. This allowed the oil and gas industry and only the oil and gas industry to put chemicals into aquifers. The act did give a small amount of incentives toward renewable energy, but it focused heavily on fewer regulations, lower taxes, heavy subsidies, and other incentives for the oil and gas, coal, and nuclear energy industries. Since then, the oil and gas industry has also been exempted from all or most of the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Comprehensive Environmental Response Act, the Compensation and Liability Act, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, the Toxic, Toxic Release Inventory under the Emergency Planning Act, and the Community Right to Know Act. Regulation of the oil and gas industry has basically been stripped from the federal government and the EPA and turned over to the states. This would be a good thing if states had the experience, regulations, and manpower to regulate the industry properly, but some states had no experience with large-scale oil and gas production, let alone any experience with fracking. Arkansas had some experience with conventional oil production, but our relatively small boom happened in the 1920s and we have had little production since then. There has also been natural gas production in western Arkansas since the 1920s, but this production has been much slower than what is happening now, and most of the wells in this area have not been fracked. The passage of this act is what has allowed fracking to explode across the country by allowing companies to frack within aquifers and reducing production costs to make horizontal hydraulic fracturing profitable. Over a million new fracked natural gas wells have been drilled in the United States since 2005. Since its adoption, the act has become commonly known as the Halliburton loophole. This chart shows natural gas prices since about 2001. You can see here is when in July of 2005 when the Energy Policy Act was passed by Congress, natural gas prices were at about $6 per thousand cubic feet. 
from there they quickly increased up to a record of $15.37 per thousand cubic feet in December of 2005 and then fell again. Since then they've been up and down until recently they're currently at a 10 year low. This is because this shale gas rush has created an overabundance of natural gas in the market and with low demand in the United States companies are currently scrambling to build natural gas export terminals on the east coast, west coast and gulf coast of the United States. There have been a dozen new companies permitted to build LNG export stations just in the last three years. This is because natural gas prices in Europe and Asia are four to five times what they are in the United States and it's much more profitable for these companies to sell this natural gas overseas than it is in the United States. This chart shows gasoline prices since about 1993. Again, as you can see here, in the summer of 2005, gasoline prices were about $2.10 per gallon. After the passage of the act, they quickly skyrocketed up to a record of over $4 per gallon while President Bush was still in office. They're currently at an average of $3.92 in April of 2012, but by the beginning of May have started to drop a little bit again. The passage of the Energy Policy Act did have some effect on natural gas prices as prices are at a 10 year low. However, this did little to affect gasoline prices as gasoline prices are more affected by global markets and Wall Street investors. The United States also does not have the infrastructure needed to be able to use the amount of natural gas that we're producing. Some politicians are pushing for government incentives for the public, private companies, and government entities to be able to use more natural gas in vehicles, in appliances, and for electricity production. However, if the United States is going to have to spend billions of dollars to upgrade their energy infrastructure, we should be pushing for sustainable renewable energy options as opposed to making ourselves dependent on yet another fossil fuel that will run out sooner or later. Some political leaders are pushing for even more drilling and more exploitation of our resources to help energy prices. But again, the Energy Policy Act did just that. It opened up vast expanses for over a million new natural gas wells and it allowed for hundreds of thousands of new oil wells. It opened up more deep sea offshore drilling in the Gulf. It opened up parts of Alaska for more drilling. It stripped many regulations for the industry and it gave more tax breaks and other incentives to the oil and gas industry. Gasoline and other energy prices are as high now as they have ever been. Natural gas again is currently at a 10 year low, but companies are currently backing off of production to allow prices to go back up so that this is profitable again. Our country must level the playing field for renewable energy sources to create competition for fossil fuels, thus creating a free market in energy and lowering all energy prices. On the state level, the industry is regulated by different agencies. The Arkansas Oil and Gas Commission, or AOGC, creates and enforces many of the regulations for the industry. There are nine commissioners that are appointed by the governor. Five of the nine own and operate oil and gas companies in the state. Two more are executives for oil and gas companies, and the remaining two are attorneys. The AOGC lists their qualifications for being commissioners as the following. Three of the commissioners are attorneys, two are petroleum geologists, one is a petroleum engineer, one is a chemist, and two commissioners have no scientific expertise. Their only experience is running industry companies. Not one of the commissioners has any environmental or human health expertise. This pre presents a clear conflict of interest for the people of this state. Keep this conflict of interest in mind as we go through the problems associated with the industry in the state. State law says that a majority of the commissioners must be familiar with the process of oil and gas extraction, but does not say that the commissioners must own or work for an oil and gas company. Many other states have conflict of interest laws that would not allow anyone with a strong tie to an industry company to serve as a commissioner. Another agency that regulates the industry is the Department of Environmental Quality, or ADEQ. This agency regulates aspects like sediment control and flowback fluids when they are on the surface. Until the start of 2011, the ADEQ only performed inspections of gas wells and other industry operations on a complaint basis, meaning they only did inspections when someone called with a complaint. They only performed a total of 540 inspections between 2004 and 2011. That's a seven year period. That's only about 85 inspections per year. During this time, there were about 3,500 natural gas wells drilled in the Fayetteville Shale area. In 2010, ADEQ was given money by the Game and Fish Commission from Game and Fish Gas Royalties to hire four new inspectors and three new administrative employees to help better inspect the industry. 
In January of 2011, ADEQ started inspecting well sites randomly, and the director was quoted as saying that they were, quote, trying to hit every well pad at least once now. There is no regulation that requires that they inspect every well pad and every fluid pit. In the summer of 2011, the Arkansas Public Policy Panel released a report detailing violation statistics. The report showed a very high rate of violations per inspection before 2011, but showed that the percent of violations dropped dramatically in the first few months of 2011. The violations ranged from improper signage to illegal dumping. This extra funding runs out in the summer of 2012, and the agency has not found any additional funding to keep these extra inspectors. ADEQ only enforces regulations. They do not make them. The regulations for ADEQ are made by the Pollution Control and Ecology Commission, or the PCNE. This commission is comprised of 13 people. Six of them are the directors of the Oil and Gas Commission, the Geological Survey, the Natural Resources Commission, the Game and Fish Commission, the Forestry Commission, and the Health Department. The other seven commissioners are also appointed by the governor. The director of ADEQ is not on the Pollution Control and Ecology Commission. Although this commission is responsible for making regulations for ADEQ, they canceled their monthly meeting in May of 2011 due to a, quote, lack of agenda items. When I talked to the director on the phone prior to the cancellation, he told me, and I quote, we just don't have anything to talk about this month. Most of the agenda items since then have had nothing to do with the natural gas industry or the Fayetteville Shale. The Arkansas Natural Resources Commission and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers issue permits for building dams to contain fresh water for use in fracking, and they also issue permits for non-riparian water use. Non-riparian water use is when the company draws water from a property that is not the same property that the well is on. The Arkansas Geological Survey also plays a role in regulating the industry. Although they do not make or enforce regulations, they study and supply information to the public, other state agencies, legislators, and the governor on things like the geology of the area, underground resources like oil and gas, aquifers, earthquakes, and other things that are related to the oil and gas industry. The director of the geological survey is Becky White. Ms. White is the daughter of the chairman of the Oil and Gas Commission, Chad White. Before being appointed director of the geological survey, she worked for 16 years as a petroleum geologist for her father's oil and gas company. This presents another conflict of interest to keep in mind, especially in a moment when we talk about the earthquake problems. The director of the Game and Fish Commission is Lauren Hitchcock. In his previous position as the deputy director of Game and Fish Commission, he was the man responsible for negotiating the deal with Chesapeake Energy to lease over 11,000 acres of Game and Fish land for natural gas production. All of the money from the leases will stay in the Game and Fish coffers, and none will go to the state's general fund. This presents another clear conflict of interest for Arkansas. Our organization has interviewed numerous employees off the record from Geological Survey, Department of Environmental Quality, Natural Resources Commission, Game and Fish Commission, and the Health Department, all who tell us that many employees of these agencies are very concerned about what this industry is doing to the environment and human health in the area, but they have basically been pressured not to cause problems for the industry. With our state agencies having a bias toward the industry and many having direct conflicts of interest, many people turn towards their state representatives and state senators. Before the last legislative session in March of 2011, a 16-member Fayetteville Shell Caucus was formed by State Senator Jason Rapert from Bigelow. Every legislator, senator, and representative who has territory inside the Fayetteville Shale and a few from outside have joined this caucus. While Mr. Rapert often boasts that 80% of the Fayetteville Shale area is in his district, he lives in Bigelow, which is about 20 miles from the closest natural gas well. This caucus was formed with the purpose of protecting the natural gas industry from new regulations and higher industry taxes that were proposed for the last legislative session and into the future. Lines from their statement said, quote, The Fayetteville Shale is an economic engine that we must protect. Our goal is to protect the economic impact of the affected counties, and we need to send the right message to the business community that we appreciate their business. This forced people in the area to reach out to legislators from other districts to help craft and pass legislation to help better regulate the industry. There were several bills concerning the industry that were presented during the last session. Seven were reviewed by the House Agriculture, Forestry, and Economic Development Committee on March 23rd of 2011. These bills had to pass through committee before they would go to the floor of the House for a vote. Before the hearing took place, many of the Shell Caucus members, led by Senator Rapert, made fiery speeches on the steps of the Capitol in front of a few hundred industry employees who all wore stickers that said Shell Employee. After interviewing many of the employees at this event, 
Many of them told us they were given a day off by their employer to be there, and some even got paid a day to come. Some companies had secretaries calling and emailing employees multiple times before this session to come to the rally at the Capitol that day, and many employees were also told that these bills would cost them their job. Senator Rapert told all of these employees to not be intimidated by outsiders trying to cause trouble, as a group of about 50 people from the shale area in support of the bill stood watching. The representatives that sponsored these seven bills were Kathy Webb from Little Rock, Greg Letting from Fayetteville, and Homer Linderman from Jonesboro. Residents and nonprofit groups from the shale area worked with employees of state agencies, these legislators, and a nonprofit group from Little Rock called the Public Policy Panel to craft this legislation. The first bill was voted on by the Agri Committee and it was voted down. The legislators sponsoring the rest of the bills decided to recommend sending the bills to interim study, knowing that they would all fail if they were taken to a vote. Interim study means that the bills are put off until the next general session, which is March of 2013. That's two years. During that time, the committee can meet to discuss the bills, and that the bills can be amended and revoted on during the next session. There has been one meeting where these bills were discussed since they were sent to interim study. Recently, three more legislators have joined the Shell Caucus to bring the total to 19. Senator Rapert and the members of the caucus have since been promoting the industry and working to defeat an increase in the severance tax. Senator Rapert has also worked with the Arkansas Energy Office and the Department of Agriculture to provide grants from state and federal taxpayer money for vehicle conversions to natural gas and to build natural gas filling stations like the one in North Little Rock. The state paid $300,000 of the cost of this station and the city of North Little Rock paid another $250,000. Natural gas industry companies have been the ones to use many of the rebates available to convert their company vehicles to natural gas and Senator Rapert himself used one of the rebates to convert his personal truck to natural gas. <clears throat> Mr. Rapert and the Shell Caucus have also been trying to get different government agencies to convert their fleet vehicles over to natural gas like city buses and school buses along with other vehicles. While gasoline prices are high and somewhat unstable, natural gas prices have been much higher and much more unstable in the recent past. It is not smart for the government to be converting state vehicles over to use natural gas, when in the near future it may no longer be cheaper for natural gas to be used over gasoline, wasting millions of dollars of taxpayer money. Again, companies are currently slowing down on production to allow natural gas prices to rise again. Another conflict of interest is presented by the county judges from the area. In mid-February of 2011, Chesapeake Energy gave five trucks to the five main Fayetteville Shell counties, Faulkner, Van Buren, Cleburne, White, and Conway County. Each county judge came to the Capitol to receive their truck. They even posed in the front of the Capitol for a picture in the paper. Less than a month later, and one week before the legislative session, these five judges, along with six more from the area, wrote and signed a letter asking the legislators to oppose the bills that would better regulate the industry. We have seen some of these judges drive these trucks to rallies and meetings in support of the industry and in opposition of the severance tax increase. Faulkner County Judge Preskin Scroggin also went on a tour with the Conway Area of Chamber of Commerce to visit six cities and urge area leaders to oppose an increase in the severance tax that natural gas companies pay on the gas they extract. They drove on this tour in the brand new compressed natural gas GMC Yukon that was given to the Conway Chamber by Southwestern Energy. The State Chamber of Commerce has also been very supportive of the industry and has helped lead the opposition of the increase of the severance tax. Currently, there are only three natural gas filling stations in the state, Fort Smith, North Little Rock, and Damascus. Mr. Rapert lives in Bigelow, just outside of Conway. The Conway Area of Chambers has to fill their Yukon overnight at Crane Automotive, and Southwestern Energy, who has a whole fleet of natural gas vehicles, has their state headquarters in Conway. All are far from these existing natural gas stations. But recently, the Arkansas Energy Office, who Mr. Rapert had been working with, awarded a $235,000 grant from taxpayer money to Satterfields to build a natural gas filling station in Conway. Let's take a look at where fracking is taking place. The fracking is taking place in people's backyards. It is important to know that it is not just something that is occurring out in the middle of the woods or in a big field somewhere. Sometimes people may live within 2,000 feet from a dozen or more natural gas wells. Currently law in Arkansas only requires that companies keep their well pads at least 200 feet from homes. This is less than a football field. Some classify the debate over the industry as an environmental or political issue. While it is definitely both, the important thing to know that first and foremost is a human health and human rights issue. Residents' health and livelihoods are being gravely affected by this industry. 
The first step in the process is the leasing of minerals. A law in Arkansas called forced integration or forced pooling allows an oil and gas company to take your minerals even if you refuse to sign a lease or give up your minerals. The state is broken up into one square mile boxes called sections. This is 640 acres. A company only needs more than 50% of the mineral rights in any section to forcibly take all of the minerals in that section. That doesn't mean they need more than 50% of the people living in the area, just more than 50% of the mineral rights property in that section. Companies have leverage over mineral owners because of this law and often send letters to mineral owners giving them two options, sign a lease and get X amount of money or be forced to sign a lease for a smaller amount of money that is determined by the Oil and Gas Commission. This leads many people to sign a lease even when they do not want to. Once the lease is signed or if you are forcibly integrated, the company has a right to do just about whatever they want on your land. Most people are not able to negotiate terms of production into their lease, such as how many wells there are on their property, where the wells will go, what hours the company can operate, where the roads and pipelines go, etc. People often complain that wells are put in prime parts of their real estate against their wishes, such as 200 feet from their home, or where they plan to build a house in the future, or in the middle of a hay field or horse pasture, instead of on the corner of the property. We know a family that had to sell many of their cattle because six acres of their prime hay field was taken. Also, mineral rights supersede property rights in Arkansas. Many people do not own their mineral rights, which were kept at some point during the history of the property by previous owners. In Arkansas, a mineral rights owner has the right to obtain their minerals from below the land owner's property, even if that means putting a natural gas well on the property against the will of the landowner. There is no law requiring that any of the royalties go to the landowner, only the mineral owner. There are many people in this state with a gas well on their property near their home who do not want the well there nor are they collecting any royalties from the well at all. Here's a picture looking from a church parking lot back to the cemetery owned by the church. And as you can see, the natural gas well pad in the middle. And here's a picture from the cemetery back to the church here that owns the cemetery. We have no clue if this church wanted this well pad here or if they signed on for it. Residents' complaints range from nuisance problems to serious health problems. Here's an example of a nuisance problem. A resident had to put their own sign on the gate because workers continued to ignore their own company sign that said to keep the gate closed. The resident's horses escaped more than once. Here's another where an area resident came home one day to find that the road to their house was closed all day with no notice. They had to drive a long way to get to the other end of their road to get home. We know of a family who had a lock put on their gate that leads to most of their farm property. No key was given to them and it took almost two weeks and numerous phone calls to get a key. During that time, some friends of the family were accidentally locked inside the property by a worker leaving the area, and this required the landowner to leave work to come home to cut the lock on the gate. We have heard similar stories from other residents about problems with locks on gates on their property. These are just a few examples of some of the nuisance problems associated with the industry. The most common complaint from residents that involves a general disrespect towards the landowner and their property is a large amount of litter. Many people tell us, and we have observed ourselves numerous times, areas on private property and along rural roads with a very large amount of litter that was not there until production started. This picture was on someone's private property, not on a public road. Most of the litter is plastic bottles and bags, food wrappers, cigarette butts, soda cans, and beer cans. We have talked to many people who have had pets run over by trucks associated with the process driving too fast down rural roads. Another problem is a loss of income by some residents and businesses from the effects of fracking. For example, the family we mentioned earlier who had to sell their cattle because their hay field was taken. We met a family who had to sell many of their horses because a very large pad was put in the middle of their horse pasture against their will. Horses are sensitive animals and the activity and pollution from this well site caused stress and health problems with their horses and a couple of them died. Property values in the areas had plummeted. People who had unused property that was intended for a retirement home or vacation home had to sell their property for a fraction of what it was worth because they could no longer use it for what they wanted. Most banks will not give people mortgages to build on property that has a gas well on it because it is, quote, an unacceptable risk. Many people have had their retirements taken from them over this industry. Here's a map of the shale gas areas or shale plays around the country. The Fayetteville Shale is the eastern half of the Arcoma Basin, which is seen here, and the western half is the Atoka Shale, which has been slowly developed since the 1920s. The Haynesville Shale in Louisiana, the Barnett Shale in Texas, and the Marcellus and Utica Shales in Pennsylvania, New York, Ohio, and West Virginia are the other three major shale plays in the United States. 
On the Oil and Gas Commission website, you can download files that show the location of each oil and natural gas well in the state, and then click on each dot to get more information about that well. As you can see, in southern Arkansas, we have had oil production since the 1920s, but it is relatively confined to a small area, as you can see here. The black dots are active oil wells. The green dots are active natural gas wells. As you can see, there's a few clusters here near Smackover uh, and other areas where there's oil production. In north central Arkansas and western Arkansas is where you have most of the natural gas production. This is the Arcoma Basin. The western half of the Arcoma Basin is the Atoka Formation. This has been developed over a period of about 80 or 90 years since the 1920s. And then you have the eastern half, which is the Fayetteville Shale, which has only been developed since 2005. There are about 4,000 natural gas wells in the western half and about 4,000 natural gas wells in the eastern half. Although, as I just mentioned, it took about 80 to 90 years to produce the 4,000 wells in the western half whereas all of them in the eastern half have pr been produced since 2005, with over 3,000 of those being produced just since 2008. Let's take a look at the Fayetteville Shale area. I'll zoom in here, and as you can see, the green dots are wells that are currently producing, the yellow dots are wells that are in the process of being drilled, and the red dots are wells that have been permitted but have not been drilled yet. Apply the location of the towns of schools in the area so you can get an idea of where this is at. Conway, Valonia, BB, Moralton are just south of the shale. And the shale ranges from Greenbrier, Mount Vernon, north up to about Clinton and Shirley, and goes from about Moralton on the western side to Bald Knob on the eastern side. As you zoom into the area, you can see that many of the dots overlap each other and many when you click on them will expand into multiple wells on the same pad. Here and here. Here is five on the same pad. I found uh, dots with up to twelve wells on the same pad before. You can also click on each individual dot and it will show you the permit number and other information about that well. You can then take this permit number to the Oil and Gas Commission website and put it in their well file database where you can see all the files that Oil and Gas Commission has on hand concerning this, these wells. Again, you can see that the impact that this has had on the area. Here's Gris Ferry Lake. This yellow line shows the Little Red River as it snakes through a high production area. Over here we have the North Fork of the Cadron Creek which snakes through the area. Both of these are very important rivers in the area. I can turn off the active wells and show you just the wells that are currently being drilled and those that have been permitted. This gives you an idea of the current production in the area at any given time. We can also turn off the location of all of the producing wells and turn on the drilling fluid disposal sites. The blue triangles are disposal or injection wells and the orange triangles are land farms where the fluid is sprayed onto the land. We'll talk about this more later. But as I zoom out, you can see these disposal sites all over the state. Western Arkansas, as well as all the disposal wells in southern Arkansas. We can also turn off the disposal sites and turn on the location of all the pipelines in the state. It shows you all the oil and natural gas pipelines in the state. We can turn this on and look at the integrated sections in the Fayetteville Shale area. I'll turn off the schools. We can zoom in and get a closer look. Again, earlier when I mentioned that the state is broken into one square mile sections and that these sections can be forcibly integrated, this shows the Fayetteville Shale and all the sections that have been forcibly integrated, which is a majority of the sections in the Fayetteville Shale area. Each one of these squares is a one square mile section that has been forcibly integrated. There are people in these sections who have their minerals taken from them. And all sections, whether they're forcibly integrated or not, have places where there are people who have had their property taken from them because the mineral rights owner was allowed to put a natural gas well on their property to obtain their minerals. Again, these maps can be downloaded from the Oil and Gas Commission website. That's aogc.state.ar.us. Go to their website, click on Maps.
then you can click on the different maps here to download. Once you have the permit number that you want, you can click on Document Image System. Click here to skip instructions. Then click on Well Files. Then you can select Permit here. Type in the permit number you wish to search and click Start Search. This will bring up all the files associated with each natural gas well or oil well in the state.